Well, welcome to our second session of Dr. Data Science uh, with myself, Nora Hosseini, as host. And today I have a very esteemed guest with me. It's uh, the world-renowned Dr. Spotfire, Mr. Neil Kanungo. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Nora. Hi, thank you. Now, this is what in, you know, the sort of Netflix space, they call a crossover episode, but we're not actually going to talk about Spotfire. Today, I just have Neil here to bounce off ideas and, and chime in with his own stories about data privacy. So before we actually get going, Neil, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about data privacy when you hear these words? What are your, what are your initial thoughts? I think privacy is becoming everything in uh, this new decade of uh, cybersecurity, uh, digitalization, as we digitize all of our operations for all of our businesses, it becomes even more important to protect our data from a security standpoint and protect the privacy of our individuals. Um, the more digital cells increase in presence, the more uh, that security and that, uh, that protection is, is relevant. Yeah. Exactly. And that's actually, I think it's kind of coming to a head right now, which is why I wanted to talk about the subject today, because there is a lot that maybe we're not so aware of as well. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Based on what you said, then, I think that's really important. And uh, this is how I wanted to actually kick off our conversation is, you know, data is becoming so prominent and in so many different places. You're thinking about um, I mean, you might not even be thinking about where your data is being passed and to whom, right? So I just looked up data on The Guardian, data protection actually on The Guardian, and look at all of these different industries that come up. You've got IKEA. The French, by the way, are leading this uh, data privacy and following up with the, the massive amounts of fines. I think the biggest one was for Google. It's now IKEA. Um, you've got you know, health apps, you've got the EU um, uh, with their own GDPR. And you have one of my favorite things about WhatsApp, actually. I don't know if you use WhatsApp, you probably do. Yeah, I use it a little bit. Yeah. Maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. So actually WhatsApp, there's a lot of um, controversy about using it because even now it's been proven they, they can actually also TV and uh, encrypted messages as well. So beyond the fact that they could use your metadata to figure out, you know, who you're friends with or when you're with people and stuff like that, um, they're actually also seeing your messages as well. But I just wanted to highlight how, you know, across all of the different things that we're doing in our everyday lives that we probably don't think of, um, we are passing bits of data of ourselves, just as you said. And I think in the next few five. 10 years, maybe the next decade, there's going to be this huge backlash and back and forth. It's going to be a tussle between, you know, technology and entities. Like who, who's responsible for data? Is it, are we happy that private companies are capturing the data? Do we trust the government more? Do we trust it less? You know, there's going to be this, it's, it's going to be a very interesting time to see what comes out of that. Yeah, and there's very good um, balance there between what uh, you want to keep, what you're able to keep for yourself, and then thinking about, okay, well, with you know Edward Snowden, he released a lot on what the NSA was doing in the U.S. and the U.S. government was doing, and then we have some other things. I think you'll talk about where even if the government's not doing it, private companies can be doing. It. You're showing it right here with IKEA. So right. there's a lot of different angles to think about with this, and. Then of course this is I think affecting pro democracy states more than it is uh, for other statist type uh, government run uh, 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 really technology industries. Um, we see how technology is used in China, for instance, and how the laws are very different. Kind of a total paradigm shift from how, or I would say polar opposite, maybe not paradigm shift, but a, um, and I think that's right. There will be this back and forth as we decide. What is the data that is necessary for us to operate in the 21st century? What should be shared? And then where does that individual, uh, the individual privacy and individual rights, the civil liberties uh, matter most? So yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting space. It's hard to operate, I think, in the 21st century without sharing such data. But at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. Once that data is out there, it can be used 
for nefarious reasons. It can be used for good reasons. It, it just depends. And society as a whole will have to discuss and figure out where that right balance is. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, one of the most prolific scandals, which I'm sure most people on this call will have heard of, is Cambridge Analytica, right? So Cambridge Analytica, but just for those who haven't, just a little context, uh, Cambridge Analytica was this company that was hired by various different uh, entities, shall we say, and uh, harvested data that was available publicly, although technically not publicly, we'll come to that. I'll explain that. But essentially, they harvested data and uh, used it to profile people to be able to assuade them to believe or not believe in their political agendas. They did this for uh, Trump and they did this for Brexit. They were clients. Uh, those were the two clients that are most spoken about. And um, I mean, so the reason we know about this is because of Christopher Wiley, who himself came out and gave... Um, I think harrowing, uh, he revealed like harrowing things about the, what he found out about data. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a second. But essentially, they managed to get stuff that you th probably thought was harmless from your Facebook profiles and put it into understanding. And not for a, a commercial gain. So it's not about like whether you would want to buy something or not, which in itself might be morally gray. We could talk about that another time but the fact that it was also used for as you said civil civic liberties and things and 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 there is a particular word for this that I'm gonna bring up now um, it's called oh actually let me tell you first about how the data was harvested because I think this is really important and I think this is also something we don't think about necessarily right we might just download an app and assume that the app is just doing what we're doing when we're interacting with it. But in this case, it wasn't. So Cambridge Analytica was so successful because they harvested so much data. And there is a limit to how much data they're allowed to. So for example, with the Facebook API, there is a limit to how much data they're allowed to actually capture from just as a public um, uh, exposure, shall we say. Like you're, you're not allowed to ping the API beyond a certain number of profiles or, or some kind of, there's some kind of measure like that. But they managed to get 50 million Facebook records by doing sort of shady things. So what they did was they used um, what they call seeders, so people who they paid to take a personality po po slash political test, right? So this is where you're saying we're on the spectrum, or maybe probably the old style of thinking like, you know, where on the left to right spectrum would they sit through this test requiring them to log in with their Facebook account. And, and a lot of companies, by the way, do this because they, it's one way to authenticate if someone is actually who they say they are in the sense that it, it, you know, Facebook has taken on that liability as well. That's an interesting point, right? Um, but then they also collected some data like likes and personal information as well as their friends' data. So especially if your profile is public, and they could see that you were related to this person, they would be able to grab more information on you, right? So they would know, okay, this is this person's aunt and maybe she likes cowboys, I don't know, whatever. They, they would get all of that information and they would figure out personality, like attributes about yourself, right? And from those attributes, they could then use that in a, in a in the classic data science way where they'd model and they'd, they'd understand which person would be most likely to do whatever. And from that, they would target them in this concept called micro-targeting. So the swing states, I think it is called, in the, I mean, you're American, you can if talk I can, to Yes, please, jump in. That's, that's right, Nora, and what's really interesting with Facebook and they're doing the micro-targeting, they're influencing too. So it's not just understanding what your patterns are, but understanding your vulnerabilities and how that can be targeted 
to influence your pers- your your decisions, not your personality, but your decisions, and and maybe at some levels how your personality and how your behavior is. And I, I wanted to point this out when I mentioned earlier with Edward Snowden and the NSA spying and that stuff that came to light in 2014, um, or was it, it, I believe it was 2014. Yep. Um, it's interesting because I had a lot of concern about how governments were spying on us to use that information to influence elections. But it didn't occur to me that the government could choose not to do that and private companies can do that if yeah. they, they could still do that from a private sense. Citizens haven't voted or established laws that pro- prohibit private companies from doing that. So private companies could do it and then the government can just contract out those private companies like Cambridge Analytica. And that's what we saw happening from, it saw this happening all over the world with different elections, with different candidates using these type of tools. Yeah. And, you know, it being public, you should be paying attention to, am I interacting with a public post? Because while you may have your information concealed, if you're interacting with a public post and you're liking something that's public, you're commenting on something that's public, then all of a sudden that information is now public and it's leaking out that way. Correct. And entire networks can be built from these type of shadow use. Exactly. And that's only one attribute that we're talking about, right? So imagine all the other things that you can get as well. Um, and, and this is what they mentioned. So here, for example, I, I pulled up this phrase because I thought it was ridiculous. If users liked curly fries, and Sephora Cosmetics, this was said to give clues to intelligence. Now, I'm hoping that that means that if you like curly fries and you like Sephora Cosmetics, both of which I do, I like to consider myself quite an intelligent person. So, I I mean, if I was on a Facebook profile and I like those things, there might be an assumption there that I'm intelligent or not. This is the fact that there's this correlation, I think, is really interesting. Hello Kitty gives you political views, which I thought was interesting. Are you into Hello Kitty, Neil? Uh, not not much, but uh, so maybe my political views are concealed in that front. <laughs> so there you go, right? So because you don't like Hello Kitty, you're probably on another spectrum. And then being confused after waking up from naps was linked to your sexuality, and more like you know, mm. what side of the fact that you're not heteronormative, basically. I thought that those kind of attributes were quite astounding, frankly. The fact that they could pull up these kind of, uh, this little bits of information to figure out whether or not you're the kind of person they need to target for whatever their end goal is. Imagine whether you've liked Hello Kitty or not. So I thought that that was really very interesting. But okay, so let's talk about since we're talking about all the different things that have to do with um, the, the ways that our data can be manipulated and such and and I don't want people to feel um, terrified I want them to feel more empowered I want to talk about the ways that you can actually protect your own data or or ways that data scientists can interact with data that are less um, consequential shall we say so one of the things that um, well beyond not using things. So personally, I don't use WhatsApp. Like that's just a one an example where I'm not actually creating data and I'm not actually contributing to, to those apps. There are a few techniques, um, some of them that you might probably have heard something of. So for example, everyone's heard of anonymization. And I think that's because a lot of the times companies will say, we completely anonymize your data before we send it out or whatever. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what anonymization techniques are actually used and and what that actually means and if something I mean in my opinion anonymization mm, it's not really a very good guarantee I'm gonna also introduce a concept called um, differential privacy which I'm not a lot of I'm not sure if people have heard of but it is definitely going to become more and more important in the next few years and then I'm going to talk about fake data at a really good open source library that I found that helps you create fake data so as a data scientist if you need to use data to model and create predictions, um, you, you can also just use fake data. 
But like I said, the best line of defense is just not sharing your own data in the first place, which I realize might be an unrealistic ask in some situations. I think this will be really exciting, Nora. I've heard about a lot of anonymization that companies are doing, but I never really knew what that meant. And here you're showing a few different methods. I don't know much about these. I'm excited to see more about what uh, what we can do as data scientists to anonymize data for our customers and our clients, and as well as just protecting people when we're doing different analysis. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's important for us to know exactly how these techniques work and why they might not always be as anonymous as we think, okay? So, okay, that's why I thought before we begin to just highlight the fact that um, anonymized data is not totally, how should I say, um, you, you shouldn't feel totally reassured when a company says, oh, you know, we, to we anonymize our data. What I'm gonna show you is that it's actually quite easy to trace back things um, it's been proven time and time again. This is actually not a very new concept, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we are trying to do in this modern day. But again, the problem is we have crazy scale, so it can it can it can get uh, interesting. All right. So one of the easier techniques um, that you can do is if you have a database with people for with something. So in this example, I'm looking at various different types of people who have different types of diseases. Um, and we all, you know, we know that our health information is also something that's considered very, very private and important. We don't want to be discriminated against because of it or manipulated by, um, um, you know, medical insurance and whatever. Um, so, so things like knowing what disease someone has and how old they are, where they live, are all quite very important attributes. One of the ways that you can can sort of get around this is by doing things called generalization and the the techniques depend on whether you're working with continuous data or categorical data so for age which is something of a continuous um, data a continuous type of data what might be better to do is um, bracketing within certain ranges so binning so for example when you're answering a survey and you're saying you're between 25 and 34 or 50 and 72, whatever. Doing that actually um, is a technique to protect your um, your privacy. The other thing is excluding, obviously, you know, things. For example, someone's religion that might not be important to us um, in in our purposes for whatever that might be. Let's say we were using this uh, for some predictive purposes. This is probably information captured for health practitioners. You know, in case of um, having to make some kind of decision, for example, if they, if they are deceased, how do they take care of the burials and all those kind of things. In those contexts, it might be important to know, but as a data scientist, we have to ask ourselves, like, do we really need to know someone's religion when we're creating a model? Is it better to just dismiss it and, and think, you know, it's not that important to our, our predictive purposes. So this is stuff, these are sort of judgment calls we need to, to make as well. So, have you heard of William Weld, the governor? I have not. You have not. You have not. not. Okay, well, so William Weld is the governor of Massachusetts, and Latanya Sweeney is actually a computer scientist. And um, what she was able to prove was with just two different, also publicly, publicly available, I'm not sure if the medical data is publicly available, or some form of it is publicly available. But using the voter list, which is publicly available, and combining that with some other data set, she's actually able to figure out, with just a few attributes, William, uh, who William Weld is and what his medical data, ethnicity, etc., would be. And the fact that you only need so many, so few attributes is actually quite concerning. <laughs> you only need to right. know zip code, birth date. And gender to be able to put, to tie these two together, which is why that technique that I was mentioning before about binning, and and actually just not using data you don't need, um, t is actually very important. And, and I think that's where some of that hierarchical can come in too, because like there's only so many people within a zip code that have exactly. a certain birth date and gender. You know, you get a really limited list. But if instead of zip code, you looked across the whole state or a whole country, you went to a higher level, 
then that will generalize it further. And, you know, all, all of a sudden you start to see more people with the same birth date and gender. And that birth date is pretty specific. I thought it was interesting on in the previous slide when you talked about doing age ranges, yeah. uh, because when you have age ranges that, you know, I've always thought about removing people's name and you see that there, you've removed people's names, yeah. but to do age ranges takes a lot of specific, specificity out. I mean, even by just having the age in there, there's 365 days in a year and you can kind of narrow down that way, but having a specific birth date down to the day, that's so specific that it's going to be very hard to keep, uh, uh, keep anonymization. Well, this is an important pr principle of, uh, so for example, the GDPR, right, the General Data Privacy Regulation that the Europeans introduced, uh, I think it was two or three years ago now, um, one of the things they talk about is personally identifiable information, that's what the PII stood for in, in the, the first slide. And this is th the point, is that how far down are you drilling into information? Because if, as you said, if you're looking at a state, okay, maybe the birth date is not going to be so important. There will obviously be a few people who have the same birth date, including the year. Um, but if you are looking in your neighborhood, maybe you're the only person with your birth date. And then, right. then it means everything is attributable to you, right? So yeah. this is this is what the concept that Latanya Sweeney has uh, created is called K-anonymity. So the fact that you um, would be able to differentiate. So if, if, an, if a data set is like K or 2K anonymous, if someone is able to differentiate at, at, that there is at least two people in certain subcategories, right? So for example, if um, there were two people with the same birth date and the same zip code, that would be considered a K2 uh, anonymous data set. Whereas if you only, and, and that's something you're always trying to mitigate. So when you're looking at your different um, attributes and your different features, you should be thinking about how uniquely identifiable are people in this and how do I abstract away the things that aren't so relevant as well um, to, to our purposes, right? So I'm actually gonna do something fun with you if you're okay uh -oh. with this yes we're gonna go to a website now and there is a very interesting website this is actually let me go back to the slides here so um whoops how many attributes do you think you need to identify someone uh oh uh oh i don't know i think uh it's scary now i would say no fewer than three but probably closer to seven. I want to say seven. Seven. All right. So let's do this. So we're going to do a test. Okay. And we're going to, this is based on um, a data set that, let me just reread this one second. Um, okay. So this demo only uses p uh, people that they've taken from some public data set based in England and Wales and the US. And I'm going to ask you some information about your specific attributes. You can share whatever you want. Of course, Neil, don't feel obliged. Um, uh, just tell me no. Or... Or... <laughs> you're going to find out about my full dating history. No, no, know, no, no, no. We're not going to. It's not going to be that bad. Don't worry. Don't worry. All the embarrassing TV shows I watch. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> We're going to do all this. Okay. So when people talk about we might share anonymous data with third parties, and this is why I'm telling you anonymous data isn't really anonymous. Let's say you live in the US, all right? Let's let's play a little bit with this. What is your zip code? My zip code? Yes. Ah, well, this is interesting because I don't have a zip code. Ah. I live on the road. But uh, I'll oh, give cool. you I'll give you my last zip code. Mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty specific. You narrow me down there. Yeah, 98199. 98199. Okay. Uh huh. How come it says? Oh, yeah, right. So, do you mind telling me your birth date? Hey. Well, that's probably enough to get me. Yeah, and then you got mail. Yeah. So, you can be identified 70% of the time. Uh oh. Isn't that crazy? Just from that. Well, that's interesting that there's probably other males with my birthday in my neighborhood. We but should not have as a big many. birthday party. Yeah, you should find them because it seems like it won't be that difficult to do. And then have a big party. Yeah. You can find them at a birthday party. 
So yeah, so this is, so if you're, as if they give you really good results here, if your employer or neighbor finds someone matching your date of birth, gender, and zip code in an anonymous health data set, you would be, that person would be you 70% of the time. Harrowing figure in my opinion. Other people yeah. have on average 83% chance of being correctly re-identified, making you much less unique. So I guess That's that good. might be good. Um, and then, I mean, this website is actually really great because you can talk, you, you can walk through, they talk to you about the specifics of sampling, which is um, a technique. I mean, there's so much to go into today because it's so broad, but um, sampling is basically one of the ways that a lot of companies try to mitigate um, sharing data. So that, so the essential, or sharing sensitive data, sorry. So the idea is, um, you know, instead of giving you, as you said, the whole state, you're only going to get a part of the state, let's say, and that would be something to enough to get going with, but not necessarily something that could be uh, traced back to you in theory. But actually, this is what they're disproving. They're proving that you can, as we saw, be identified 69% of the time with just those attributes, the fact that you were male, the fact that we have your birthday, and the zip code. You said seven, and we have three. Oh, boy. Now, if we put in more, more, if we put in marital status, number of vehicles, I mean, we can can add or not. If this has freaked you out, we can close this. (laughs) We'll put in, we can put in marital status, and then, um... Marital status. Maybe we'll blur out, I'm, I'm married, I'm now married. So... Um, 84% chance by adding that in. If you add in how many vehicles you have. Well, we can add this in as long as you promise to blur it out. Promise. <laughs> Is it like 20? Right. Is that why it's like 100% new? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm rolling deep with 20 cars. <laughs> yeah. It uh, pays really well. Come work for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, the correct answer is one car. 98%. 98% chance. 98%. Look at that. Insane. So we're at five attributes there. Well, hold on. I said I said seven attributes, but you have year, month, and day. That's three. Fair enough. <laughs> so the last thing I'm going to talk to is a new, new-ish principle in the sense that it's, it's going to become more and more um, important and as time goes on. Um, which is differential privacy. Now, a lot of the, the sort of bigger companies already do differential privacy in a lot of um, different ways. But I just wanted to, before I start going into what it is exa- exactly, sorry, Neil, do you know what it means? Do you know what differential privacy is? I don't know what differential privacy is. Why don't you tell me more? Okay, so since you don't know, I just um, wanted to share these images from a data camp course where they are explaining differential privacy and how it works. So essentially, if you are, um, so as we said before, you know, you're using an app. So this is done at Uber, this is done at Google, whatever. You're using an app and um, you're pinging their different servers to interact with their app. You know, you're picking up from this location, blah, blah, blah. What happens is all of this is going and being stored somewhere. And um, the idea is if people like data scientists or data engineers or people downstream or even people just calling their APIs to get that information um, would be using that data in some form, the, you, you don't give the exact data. What you do is instead you kind of mess it about. So you add a little noise to the, to the raw data so that you fudge it up a little bit, right? So it's not like you can't um it's not like they will know exactly but, uh, sorry it's not like the person who is pinging the api will o- always have the exactly correct information a lot of it might be sort of fudged which is what the d- differential privacy does by adding noise uh, but it will be accurate enough for whatever purpose they have downstream especially because you have such huge quantities of data right so if it's someone I trust, like let's say I really trust Google with my data, or you know someone. Some, Have you learned nothing, Neil, in this call? I know, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just trying to pick some some uh, example here. Let's say there's someone I really, really trust. Like you know, okay, it's, I think Google's got good security. They're not going to abuse it. And I trust them with my data. I can just 
they, I can just give them that raw data and what they will do is apply noise to it so that if anyone requests information, they're getting a private answer, they're getting that noise. But if I don't trust Google with my data, and what I can do is I can feed Google that noise, that noisy data, and that way that untrusted aggregator, they don't ever actually have the right information so that I don't have to trust them to add the noise because I'm giving them the noise. So right. yes, this is this is similar, but the idea here is you actually have a, a it's called a privacy loss parameter, epsilon, all right? So the epsilon, the higher the epsilon, the more accurate the data, meaning that if you do need it to be quite accurate for whatever purposes, as you said, you know, if you trust Google, <laughs> and, um, and they need it for some specific purpose, which I'm not exactly sure of. I can't really think of a good one off the top of my head. Um, but maybe Uber, for example, right? Uber, you, you take all these different cabs and you need to, you have a dispute of some sort and they need to pull back the specific information on you, right? Maybe they also want to aggregate that information in some way so that they could see, is it just, you know, oh, Nora, she's a problematic passenger or is it that there is actually something going on with that driver in that area or something like that? So the having that epsilon factor can help you increase or decrease the noise depending on what your purposes are. Cool. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was the Faker open source Python library, which um, if you are creating um, machine learning models in Python, uh, there is a great library that can help you make um, fake data so you and the nice thing about it is that it can be quite specific to the different country that you're in so for example if you're trying to write some if you're trying to make something that's specific to Japan um, they also have a Japanese addresses and uh, because of the methods that they've created like here you know you see address and name they can just they, there's just techniques randomized techniques um, to make fake information so if what you're doing which I, I think is a good idea, right? So if you don't really need very specific information, but you can do what you need to do with fake information, then probably that's the better choice to use. Um, I, I got a really cool one for you too, Nora. This yeah. is this is a good library, but if you need the fake profile picture, uh, oh. there's this website. There's this website you can go to. Share the uh, website. Let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. It's called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Oh, it's the GAN website, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. let's yeah. let's show our audience that. Here, I'm not exist. Okay. Yeah. And you click that, and you can just refresh that page, and every time you refresh it, what it's doing is an adversarial network. Nice. And that is creating an image. Um, this person does not actually exist. Yeah. So that's so you don't have to be worried about taking someone's actual profile picture. What this is doing is using a neural network to actually generate these features and generate these facial features of a person. And that's a nice way to, to randomize even more. I think that's excellent. That's all I had for you today, Neil. So what did you learn about data privacy? Are you going to go delete everything off your phone now? Oh man, hopefully it's not too late because I had so much on there, but uh, thanks for uh, teaching me more about the different methods to anonymize. I appreciate that and uh, I'm definitely going to be thinking about this and other data I use, uh, not just as I use as a data scientist, but data I put out there. Mm -hmm.